Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of all of the Bible Talk team, I want to welcome you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing on today in our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is the eighth week in this, in this study, uh, so we're, we're not zooming along, but if we get through before the Lord comes, it'll be good. And if he comes before we get through, probably be even better. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just praise you and thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word made flesh who dwelt among us. And I thank you for your word and all that was written in earlier times, written for our instruction, that we might have hope, that we might just be closer and closer to you, be more and more like you. Lord, we praise you and thank you for your word. We just love you, Lord, and we want to love you more. So I pray that you open the eyes of our heart, that you open our understanding, that we would see wonderful things in your word. Know more about your son, Christ Jesus, that we might be more like your son, Christ Jesus. So we thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Well, as I said, we're, uh, this is the eighth part. We had left off last week. Let me just uh, catch up here. We had left off in, I think we got up to verse nine. We did verses 8 and 9 last week. So I'm going to pick up and start at verse 10. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are his workmanship. You know, it says in Isaiah 64, 8, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. You know, you have to make sure, because there's such a, a tendency to want to do this in this day and age, that you never become a self-made man. Taking credit for the work that God has done and is doing in you and through you. All right? All the glory has to go to him. And you better understand that it's his work in you that you should greatly, greatly desire because he can do in your life what you most assuredly cannot do in your own life. It says in Romans eleven thirty six, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So I pray that God, you know, that people see the work of God in you and glorify God for his work in you. You know, he created, it says, he created in Christ Jesus, he created this in us, in Christ Jesus, for good works, not to earn salvation. I mean, that's what we covered in depth last week, but to glorify God, proclaim him, complain, com, proclaim his hope and his glory. You know, it said in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men, in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Praise God. You want them to see your works, but not so that you get the glory, but in order that he might get the glory. And then so we should walk in them, is what it says in the next part of that verse. Listen, don't, don't be good. You can't. Jesus said, no man is good, but be holy, even as he is holy. And let the Lord work his works in you for the glory of his name, and as a testimony to the world that is filled with bad works. And that's a fact. I promise you that if you, if you walk in the Spirit of God, doing the good works, you know what? The world will take notice. By the way, I don't know what you think of good works, you know, feeding the hungry, doing this, doing that. But the simple fact is the disciples had the same question. They, they came up to Jesus and said, Lord, what, what must we do to, to work the works of God? And Jesus said to them, believe in him whom he sent. He said, believe in me. That's the work of God. Your faith is the work. Everything else takes care of itself. All right, so I'm going to read on now. And I want to pick up, and I'm going to read all the way from 11, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. Paul writes, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, 
having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who, who you formerly were far off from, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. So that in himself he might make the two into one man, one new man. You know, Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's Galatians 3, verses 26, 27, and 28. So if you, brother or sister, find yourselves divided in any way, from any other brother or sister in the Lord, in any way, for any reason, you are not in Christ. You have separated yourself from him. And you know, Jesus made that abundantly clear when he said, truly I say to you, that to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Matthew 25, 40. What you did to the least of his brethren, you did to him. So if you have something, a grudge, if you are separating from a brother, you're separating from Christ. And believe me, that's a lot easier for the devil to accomplish than it is for him to try and get you to separate. Oh, I'm not going to hang out with Jesus. I'm not going to be with Jesus anymore. He doesn't have to get you to do that. All he's got to do is get you to separate from the brethren. There's a bit of a paradox here, right? You see, if you recognize that you have, a, you need to have a closer, a better relationship with Whatever, fill in the blank. With whatever. I mean, this person, that denomination, that group, that whatever it is. The answer is not to focus on getting closer to, fill in that blank again. The answer lies in getting closer to the Lord. This falls within that all things category. You know what I'm talking about? All things? Because Jesus said again in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you, Matthew 6, 33. The more clearly you see Jesus, and that's what we're to do, the more clearly you see him fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, that's what it says in Hebrews 12, too, the better your peripheral vision will become, and the more clearly you will see the brothers or sisters on the side, in front of you, on the side of you, around you, even the least of them. Which brings me to, I want to talk about the triangle of love. You know, this past week, we did a, a Bible bite, which we do post every week, and it was called the radius of love, the circle of love. That the triangle of love is what I want to talk about right now. And first, let me say that I know that in the world, love triangles are not good things, okay? However, in the spirit, love triangles are the rule. Think about this. All right. A man came to Jesus. Well, it says, I'm going to read Mark 12, 28 to 31. One of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he, Jesus, had answered them well, asked him, which is the foremost commandment of all? And Jesus answered and said to him, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And second, the second is like, namely this, you shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Got it? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. It's a triangle, right? So real love for anybody has to start with and be based on real love for the Lord. Or else, because if it's not that, I'm, I'm going to read you something from my book, The uh, the, the Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus. 
I wrote our divisions keeping us apart lessens the manifestation of the presence of God in our lives. Our division impedes our prayer life. Our division weakens us. Our division hampers our evangelism. Our division slows or prevents God the Potter from perfecting us. Our division infects and affects our praise and worship. Our division blocks the Lord meeting our needs. And our division separates us from the Lord. If you want, write to me at office at BibleTalk.com and I'll send you the notes on that, all right? But right now, let me, let me just illustrate this a little bit. And I'll start where I think most people think of when we talk about love. You think about a man and a woman, all right? So the first thing is there is a love triangle. And I'm going to put this up on the screen. You have a, a man, I'm showing a man and a woman down at that straight line, okay? And they get closer and closer to each other. So you see them moving together. But then there's always a crash. But there's so, all too often a crash, right? And they try and fix it and make it all better with counseling, psychology, seminars, self-help help books. But as often as not, they just keep getting farther and farther apart. Unless and until they turn to the Lord God Almighty. And then you'll see that instead of focus on each other, if they focus on the Lord and start going up towards the Lord, what happens is, they each start to close, when they start to seek a closer relationship with him, the closer they get to the Lord, the closer they get to each other. You see that on this? Until, hallelujah, there are one in Christ. And there you have that three again. God, the man, and the woman. That's when love becomes real, effective, and powerful. Hallelujah. It's reaching the goal. Because, as Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere, the King James says, unfeigned faith. You can't, you know, you, you, you may be able to fake some people about faith, but I promise you that God knows if you're walking in faith. And remember that Jesus said, talking about those last days, he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? And you know what? You can't show me faith. You can only show me the actions that come from the faith that you proclaim to have. Isn't that what James said? There's no disparity at all between the Apostle Paul and, and James. You know, Paul said it's all about faith, and it is all about faith. But faith has to take action. You have to believe it in your heart. You have to confess it with your mouth, and you have to walk it with your feet. That's the truth. So the idea is to love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. And even, and here's where it may get a little tougher for you, because Jesus said, I'm going back to the Sermon on the Mount again, as I like to do. Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Matthew 5, 44 and 45. You not only have to love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself, you've got to love the unlovable. And you can do that because as it says in Romans 5, 5, God has poured his love into your heart. So you have the love, you have the power to love the unlovable. But you have to choose to use it. I want to read verse 19, Ephesians 2, 19. He says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You're no longer strangers and aliens. Consider this. We are to reside in the world as strangers and aliens passing through on our way to the land of promise. All right? For, for there, the Lord, the Lord spoke to Moses out in the, in the wilderness, right? And he said, the land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are but aliens and sojourners with me. Leviticus 25, 23. Here in this world, 
you're just you're passing you're way poor remember hear that, that song four way pairing stranger I tell you it's uh, it's got a lot of it's got a tremendous amount of truth in it and so when moses uh, had his firstborn son he named him gershon what that means is he was a, the names means in hebrew stranger in a strange land that's in exodus 222 so those words must have had a real impact on on Peter. He said, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, strangers, it says in the King James, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. First Peter 1 1. He's writing to the saints and saying, You're you're aliens and sojourners. That's who he's writing to. He said, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Uh, certainly, what Jesus had prayed to the Father at the garden that night on his way to the cross, prayed so hard that he bled, I mean, prayed, bled, he was bleeding from the passion of his prayer. And he said in his prayer, they, speaking of us, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. This is where it comes from to know that while we're in the world, we can be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus was not of the world. And we're not in the, you know, we, we, this is not home. Absolutely not home. And I've shared this with you before a lot. Uh, I was preaching in London a number of years ago, and we were we were through the tra a lot of travels, and we were getting ready to fly back to the States, and somebody came up to me at the end of the service and said, I understand you're going home tomorrow. And I said, only if the plane crashes. That's where home is. And it's nothing to be afraid of going to. Hallelujah. It's something we should look forward to. To live as Christ, to die as gain. So he goes on and he says, in, the, in this verse, he says, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You know, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 20, and he says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you eagerly waiting for him to show back up? Are you eager to, to go and be with him? Or are you so tied into the world? You know, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, no soldier on active duty entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. Don't get, don't get tangled up in the affairs of everyday life. I mean, do what God has called you to do and do it in a way that people see his work in you for his glory. But the simple fact of the matter is, remember, it's better there than it is here. He said, okay. Al, you know, Alice and I, my wife Alice and I, We've lived, we've really been blessed to over the past more than four decades, four and a half decades about, to have lived and traveled in many, many countries around the world, preaching and teaching the word. Now, that's really changed my understanding. It's blessed my understanding of these verses so much. You see, wherever we were, we lived as aliens. We spent time, we lived in, in Belize, Central America, ministering all over Latin America, over, we've lived in England. We've lived, I mean, spent time in West Africa and East Africa. Wherever we are, we live. Living is not a matter of whether you own a house or not. It's a matter of living the fullness of life in Christ wherever you are. But the way it blessed my understanding is because wherever we were, I was paying the taxes. I was uh, obeying the speed limits and all of the other laws often far better than the regular, the actual citizens of the country were. I mean, I've done a lot of teaching in foreign countries about those people being submissive to governing authorities, which is the word of God, right? But while we were there, we were still aliens. We were strangers. We were never allowed to take part in their elections. We could not and certainly not did not desire to, to vote. But we... We were there, we were doing all other things. We didn't have the rights to citizenship because we weren't citizens. It's like being an ambassador. You know, it says we're ambassadors for Christ. 
ambassadors go and they can live in a foreign country that they're assigned to. And they can live there. They have to, like I said, they're supposed to, they're supposed to obey the rules. That, but they represent the country they're from. Wherever we are, we represent the kingdom of God. You see, I, I was aware early on that my situation and my attitude was no different if I was in Los Angeles or in London. No different if I was in Miami or Nairobi, Kenya. It was no different if I was in New York City or Belize City. Regardless, and like I said, I'm still not home yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Ephesians 2.14 For he himself, talking to Jesus, he himself is our peace, who made both groups, because he's talking about the Gentiles and, and the, the, the Jews, right? The circumcision and the uncircumcision. He brought both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Let me tell you something. I'm old now. I, I don't know. I, I'll tell you, well, I'm 76 years old as we film this. And I went to Catholic schools all of my childhood life. I mean, from first grade up until uh, I graduated from a boys, all boys college prep. Uh, and this is back. So starting in the beginning of the 50s and up into I graduated in uh, 61. I was taught. And I guess I believe that the Jews were the Christ killers. It took God and his word to open my eyes to the fact that I'm the Christ killer. Because it was my sin that he went to the cross for. And it was your sin. Did the Jews call for his death? Absolutely. So they hired the Italians to do it. I mean, we're all involved, right? The only non-guilty party that ever walked the face of this earth is Jesus Christ. Not you, not me. But thank God, thank God for his grace and mercy, which wiped clean that slate. He brought down the barrier. There was a barrier. And unfortunately, in all too much of the church, there still is that barrier between the Gentiles and the, and the Jewish believers, between the white believers and the black believers, between the wealthy believers and the poor believers. There should be no barrier because Christ tore them down. We are all one. We are all equal. God can use us differently, but he paid the same price. I, I'll share this quickly, I, and I know I have before. I was preaching years ago in a Salvation Army. Did you know that was a church? And this was a spirit-filled Salvation Army church. And the, the pastor there had became a good friend of ours, and he had been a, a rock and roll singer, professional rock and roll singer, before he was saved, and I was preaching there, and they had a bunch of prisoners on prison work release program. They, these prisoners would get out of jail and be able to come to the service on Sundays. And I don't remember what caused it, but I, I just said, you know, what are you worth? And these prisoners in the back walls, they got into this, and they said, you know, I'm worth whatever it was. The minimum wage was three dollars an hour, or whatever, and they start calling it out. And and I said, well, let me show you something. Now, this pastor, as I mentioned, was a professional musician, and he had a guitar there, which was a very, very expensive guitar. And I walked over, over and carefully picked it up. Made him a little nervous, I think. And I asked him, I said, what is this guitar work, worth? And he said, I think, like $5,000. And I said, well, what, what do you want to sell? It? And not one person in the world would give you more than $3,000 for it. How much is it worth? He said, well, then I guess it's worth $3,000. I said, but suppose somebody came through the door, looked at the guitar and said, boy, I've been looking for exactly that guitar, that model, that year and everything. I'll, I'll give you right now, I'll give you $10,000 for it. How much is it worth? It's worth $10,000. Because you know what establishes value? What somebody is willing to pay for it. And you know that the word of God says that you, you were purchased with a price. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. And you know what the price was? The price was... Jesus Christ. God the Father valued you at Jesus Christ. He was willing to pay Christ for you. That's how much you're worth. If you could only grasp that, if you can only get that really into your into your heart, into your mind, into your, and understand how precious you are in the sight of God, then go back and read Romans chapter 8 and see you'll understand what Paul was saying all the better. 
All right. See, he's our peace. He himself is our peace. Natural man cannot produce true, lasting peace. It's not within them. It's not within their power. Jesus promised and gave, the, gave us a peace that passes understanding. And that's why it says in Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The world and its governments, its politicians and its armies cannot do that and never has done it. Oh, yeah, there's been periods, you know, at the end of a war where there's been a peace. But most if you want to be honest and look at it historically, they're not peace. It's like a ceasefire while I reload because the conflict just continues. Times change, countries change, weapons change, allies and allegiances change, but fallen man's heart remains exactly the same. The only thing that can save that is the grace, the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to tell you something. Before I was saved, I was a warmonger. I was absolutely a warmonger. I volunteered for service and served. I served, I flew as an air crewman in the Navy. I was involved well, I'm from the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, right into the Vietnam War. And the vast majority of the time, I was on hazardous duty. I mean, and I not only wanted to bomb Vietnam out of existence back then, because that's where my heart was, but I thought, as long as we're on the way, Let's have a look at Paris as we fly back. Drop some bombs there. And being a New Yorker, you know, I had it in my heart, well, let's take care of New Jersey while we're at it. But that's another story. This past year, in 2019, there were more than, you can check these statistics, there were more than 400 mass shootings in the United States of America. You think we're a nation of peace? This is a nation that is at war with itself. Your only hope is Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. As I said, I was a right-wing, conservative, gun-toting warmonger. And yet, God loved me and took me from that place to another, from where I could see that all of the blood shed on all of the battlefields, all of the beaches and fields, across time, did not bring peace. But the blood shed on a little hill just outside of Jerusalem, 2,000 years ago, the blood of an unblemished lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that blood brought me total lasting peace that passes understanding as it's written. And now I understand for sure what God meant when he spoke through the prophet Isaiah to say this, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon against, formed against me shall prosper. I am safe and secure from all alarm. And Father, I just thank you so, so much that I don't have to get involved in the political system or anything else to try and find peace and safety. But I can stand, and you brought me up out of that pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. And Lord, I am indeed safe in you. And I thank you for that. Help us to share that good news and bring other people to that place where they are safe and know that they are because of your love for them. Father, I pray that in his name, your son's name, Jesus Christ. Well. Time flies when you're having fun. So until next week, and we'll be back next week with the next part. May the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of his name. Bye-bye. Bye.